So uh, finally, I have Dr. Amy Doshi, sorry, Ami Doshi. Dr. Um, Ami Doshi is a faculty member at the Fowler College of Business at San Diego State University. Her perspective as a researcher is informed by experiences in biotech, research and development, as well as US Food and Drug Administration, as well as entrepreneurial de development at the Kauf Kaufman Foundation. Dr. Doshi's current work explores the nexus between innovation, science, and sustainability as they relate to global cha challenges of climate change, water scarcity, as well as food insecurity. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Jo Doshi. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Baksamusa. I appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me all right. Um, so I guess let's just jump right in. Uh, maybe the next slide, please. So uh, while our focus is on San Diego County, we are fundamentally a cross-border region. So it's really helpful, I think, to uh, just briefly set the stage about what is happening globally. Uh, and that also helps us understand best practices thinking. So first, you know, we're facing uh, increasingly complex and intertwined challenges, uh, such as water scarcity, uh, political destabilization, and, and economic turbulence. Uh, climate change and population growth. Uh, it's been estimated that by 2050, uh, the world's population will reach 9 billion. Um, so given these demographic shifts and changes in consumption patterns that go along with it, uh, there is an escalating need uh, for resources and energy uh, for food production and organized distribution, which then, of course, you know, exacerbates uh, sustainability and environmental ecosystem degradation issues. Um, and the extractive industries really are responsible uh, for the main global uh, carbon emissions, uh, which leads to you know, negative impacts on climate and natural systems. Um, we're also in the midst of a global water crisis, uh, which is worsened by intensive agricultural practices and climate change induced uh, combinations, you know, seesaw effect of uh, extreme weather and relentless drought. Uh, it, as part of that, you know, we see that uh, key waterways are actually evaporating uh, due to the Earth's hot temperatures, uh, including the Colorado. Um, and so this is having disastrous uh, ripple effects on agriculture, on uh, global shipping routes and supply chains, uh, energy supplies, and even potable water. Um, so again, this is an especially important consideration given our, our cross-border location um, and our relationships, right, with our neighbors to the south. Um, we also know from history that uh, vulnerable populations have uh, very few options, right, when, when they're faced with shrinking water supplies. Uh, environmental degradation and, and poor governance practices uh, played a critical role in Darfur's, you know, communal conflicts. Um, and a four-year drought in Syria uh, set the stage for all the violent uprisings uh, over a decade ago. Uh, which then were accompanied with mass migrations, right? That's not such an impossible scenario for many parts of the world now. So the safety and sustainability of food systems uh, is a critical building block uh, for global well-being and, and equity, but it is a system that's under duress. Uh, according to a 2022 report by the United Nations, uh, 2.1 billion people uh, worldwide struggle to even get adequate meals uh, each day, and more than 3 billion people uh, are actually even unable to afford uh, a healthy diet. So then when you add the disruptive forces of climate change, COVID-19, uh, and the economic shocks uh, that are affecting the most vulnerable populations, add in a war in, in Europe, um, key pillars that would ensure food security, like uh, availability, access, utilization, uh, and stability, those have all been systematically dismantled. Um, and so the scale and interconnectedness of these problems uh, at this point in time means that we need uh, models of collaboration that unite sectors and disciplines, uh, and they foster trust uh, among all the stakeholders that are involved. So we need a, a mosaic of lenses, if you will, uh, to expand the boundaries of, of what we can understand and create, because uh, how we perceive phenomena really determines what we perceive. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so here, um, our current, so let's maybe talk a little bit first about what do we mean by circular economy model? 
So our current linear system uh, of thinking is based on this perceived, uh, you know, this perceived abundance uh, and almost infinite supply of materials and resources and nutrients. Uh, but we all know this is not realistic. It's not sustainable. Um, you know, because a linear system is really designed to send materials in one direction, right? Ending uh, either in a landfill or deposited into the environment uh, in a state where it's really hard to recapture uh, and often, you know, has harmful impacts that go along with it. And this is often referred to as the culture of, you know, take, make, dispose. Um, and it's effective when you're extracting new materials from the earth, but it's ineffective uh, when in its ability to recapture uh, those things. So the, again, the linear system assumes that our supply of resources is infinite uh, and that the earth can absorb all of our waste. So this is where the elegance and, and kind of the innate logic of systems thinking really comes into play. Uh, circular economy uses uh, theory and principles from industrial ecology. And, and built on the idea that in industrial systems work as natural ecosystems. Um, and so the aims of industrial ecology are to have a closed loop of materials and substances uh, and reduce both resource consumption and, uh, and also reduce the discharges into the environment. And so by design, uh, circular economy is restorative uh, and it mirrors nature um, in actively enhancing and optimizing uh, the systems. And so also the rationale for circular systems is based on the reality of resource scarcity, right, which is a fundamental difference from our linear system of thinking. Uh, and it also recognizes the environmental, uh, social, health, and governance problems uh, that come with the extraction of, of new materials from the earth. So this means that circular economy uh, model think or thinking is, is a very promising strategy, right? Uh, to address the challenges that, that you know, affect our planet and support um, you know, sustainable and regenerative practices. Uh, because the priority of regenerative is to actually push beyond sustainability um, and create feedback loops between physical, natural, economic, and social capital uh, that are mutually supportive. And so this regenerative thinking provides structural support uh, to empower uh, marginalized and vulnerable populations. And it creates the conditions that are needed to adapt uh, a new set of values uh, and reorganize in ways that emphasize uh, collaboration and learning and just as importantly, innovation. Um, and so circular economy models, you know, very similarly are focused on the optimal uh, use and reuse of resources uh, along the entire value chain uh, from raw material extraction all the way to consumption. Um, so products gain value as they're manufactured, um, though the, you know, through the input of materials and labor and energy. Um, recycling a product uh, captures less value um, than we would imagine because it requires energy to do that. And some materials actually break down uh, in the recycling process. Um, so finding ways to reuse uh, a product keeps much of that original value. Um, now, implementation of, uh, you know, circular economy is a very popular uh, paradigm, but it's not always easy to undertake um, because like all other sustainable models, um, it requires not only innovative concepts, but innovative actors. And by that, I mean uh, it, it requires uh, or implementation requires support from stakeholders who will help to create the conditions uh, for changes in policy and decision-making tools. Um, so, you know, this is something that we assume, but it's not an easy thing. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so even with all of these innovative concepts and, and cooperative and collaborative actors, we still need to resolve the, the fundamental issue of how critical elements of a food system, and by this I mean food and water, um, are economically conceptualized. Um, cultivated food is, is fully privatized, and which means that uh, human beings can eat food as long as they have the money to produce it or buy it. Uh, so with this, you know, no money, no food uh, rationale, uh, hunger still prevails in, in a world, you know, of abundance. Um, so in order to provide a sound foundation for a transition to sustainable food systems, um, the very nature of food as a purely private good has to be uh, reconceptualized and challenged and actually reversed. Um, food should be viewed as a common good. 
And so when we use this lens, uh, it allows us to, to redesign the, the dominant agro-industrial food system uh, that sees food as merely a commodity. Um, instead, we want to transition our thinking towards a more equitable uh, and farmer-centric uh, food system, much like my colleagues were speaking about before me. Um, so, you know, already several food-related elements are already considered common goods, right? You know, fish stocks, uh, agricultural knowledge, right? Uh, food safety regulations, um, and even things like, you know, hunger eradication and public health, right? So once we embrace the idea that uh, that the commons can be applied to, the, to food, uh, we can think about alternative mechanisms to govern its, its uh, production and its distribution. Um, for instance, maybe a, a hybrid, like tri-centric uh, governance system that's characterized by market rules, uh, public regulations, and, and collective action. So this, you know, and I, I guess I could talk more about it, but I, I'm noticing I only have a few minutes, but uh, with this management of common pool resources or natural, it's, it's a classic collective action dilemma. And typically, you know, this, the governance of these global commons focus on uh, nation states, right, as, as the appropriate actor for managing these resources um, and or the process. But, you know, international cooper cooperation efforts are often uh, punctured by, you know, free rider problems, you know, opportunistic behaviors. And so, you know, what we want to do is create uh, something called a poly polycentric uh, or ecosystems approach to which recognizes the fundamental inter interdependence of multiple interests, multiple institutions, and uh, mechanisms that enable trust, uh, reciprocity, commitment, uh, and it empowers stakeholders to take the actions that are necessary uh, without waiting for governments to make the first move. Um, and, I, and the idea here is that rather than concentrating power at global or national uh, levels, authority should be vested in individuals and communities and local governments and NGOs, um, because they're the ones who can provide legitimate and cross-disciplinary information uh, to policymakers, right, that reflect uh, the reality on the ground, the multi-layered reality on the ground. And, and also they have the skills to do what we call, you know, institutional navigation, figuring out uh, you know, what are sort of strategically, what are the right venues in which to participate, who are the right uh, stakeholders to speak with and, and, and get buy-in. Um, and so, again, this is more a shift back to a uh, decentralized network of, of, of food systems. Next slide, please. Okay. So digging a slightly little bit deeper, uh, this then raises the question of whether the circular uh, economy can actually mitigate resource use and climate change to the extent that it's needed. Um, it, you know, this offer a circular economy, I'm just going to say CE to speak faster. Uh, it potentially offers a way to decouple environmental impacts from economic growth, right? This is the, you generate more profit uh, while reducing environmental impact. Um, so it fits well with this prevailing economic growth narrative. Um, but, you know, this fit with business as usual uh, means that there's a risk that that circular economy would basically perpetuate this current state of resource use and climate impact um, and maybe even worsen it, right? Uh, so we already see this with uh, industries such as, you know, fashion uh, and packaging. So while uh, some of these initiatives for addressing sustainable production uh, are useful and interesting, um, there, is a, there is a movement uh, called sufficiency-based circular economy that speaks to consuming less, uh, the importance of consuming less. And so this has, is, does, does not fit with the business as usual modality. Um, and the CE paradigm doesn't exclude this, but uh, by not emphasizing this aspect uh, more prominently, uh, practitioners of this CE paradigm, uh, you know, basically run the risk of focusing on very incremental resource strategies that really fail to mitigate uh, the issues of this predominant industrial system. So the idea here, and if you can see in the, in the pyramid, is that you move from a consumption-oriented society towards a society that's based not only on, on circular economy, but on sufficiency. And this means it's, it's a society where we manage with, in some cases, much less. Um, it's, it's a mind shift, it's a global mind shift, uh, towards you know, having enough for a good life, uh, but without the unnecessary excesses, right, of the modern developed world. 
Um, and it requires, you know, it's, for instance, equality and fairness uh, across, this, you know, society and environment. Uh, so the shift is really focusing more on health and well-being rather than monetary incomes. Um, this also fosters an intergenerational perspective, right? The sense of uh, stewardship, right? Uh, and rather than short-term thinking. Um, and, and perhaps more important, most importantly, it's, it really fosters a collective sense of commitment and responsibility. Um, and so this is, uh, th again, so that's, I'll move fast. Next slide, please. <laughs> All right. Um, so most of the economic and management studies that you, that you come across out there on the topic of energy or carbon or financial savings really focus on uh, single food subsectors, right? Like bakery, bakeries or dairies or, or such, or the location like the United States or the EU. Um, there are not many assessments, unfortunately, on of developing countries to help us understand like, you know, BRICS uh, economies or even those in Sub-Saharan Africa um, because this industry is, is fragmented, right? And, and what we know is that um, there are a lot of local assumptions about a given process, even in our county, right, that, that really drive uh, our understanding of this. Um, and so here, there's the, this graphic shows a socio-technical system uh, that characterizes the complex uh, relationships that you find in a, in a global food system, which, you know, ultimately impact us as well. Um, the barriers, which are shown in gray, uh, exist at many levels, uh, you know, to kind of diffusing these options that are out there for decarbonizing. Um, but the benefits, which are shown in red, uh, are, are huge, right? They're vast. And, and so thankfully, we have financing flows and business models and specific policy mixes, which are shown in orange, um, that can be harnessed uh, to tackle these barriers as well. One way that uh, business leaders are working to build a more sustainable world uh, and hit these net zero goals um, is by supporting farmers and ranchers uh, to introduce innovative management policies that prioritize nature uh, as well as agricultural production. Um, there's a project called the New Acre Project um, is, is a model that allows corporations to support farmers uh, financially so they can still uh, you know, invest in adopting nature positive uh, practices into their operations. Um, the corporation basically is paying the farmer to do things differently. Uh, and so the farmer doesn't have to lose the income, right? That's kind of the premise of it. Next slide. So I just want to close by offering uh, a lens that, uh, for me at least, gives kind of a, univer a universal basis for why this matters. Uh, the South African term Ubuntu means humanity. Um, and the concept is often interpreted as, you know, I am because you are. Um, and it's the philosophy that we're bound together uh, in invisible ways. And we must care for those around us and succeed. And we succeed by relying on each other. So if you extrapolate uh, kind of from this core truth, the idea is to, is to build mutually beneficial partnerships uh, among civil society, the private sector, and the public, se public sector, uh, between farmers, fishermen, family business owners, uh, policymakers, scientists, and the government, uh, so that everyone can succeed, uh, not just incrementally, but we succeed together and exponentially. And that's the end. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Ami, uh, and thank you for grounding us at the end in terms of um, the circular economy. It is good to uh, remember that we are part of a planetary system, life system, and that there are many interconnected parts in it. I particularly um, wanted my first question to be focused on the self-sufficient circular economy concept. What we're trying to do and what most climate action databases are, are kind of around those three R's that we talked about, and you added a fourth R. And what does that mean in terms of practically in specific actions that we could add to our database for, for that fourth R? Sure. Um, so, I mean, I there's some. I think my colleagues probably gave, have some better examples. But I, uh, for instance, things like um, you know carbon farms, uh, regenerative agriculture. Um, you know, we know that undisturbed soil uh, stores carbon, right? So, small changes even in how land is managed uh, can make soils into carbon sinks once again. Um, farmers can use more crop types um, and also smart farming tools uh, like, you know, equipment that uses big data uh, and AI. Um, another 
possibility is the use of or integrating the use of smart fertilizers. Um, and these are microorganisms basically that are, are bred or engineered to live in harmony uh, with crops and, and they capture nutrients from the environment um, and, and provide them uh, to the crops without any waste. Genetic engineering at work. Uh, another area is something uh, that's called precision fermentation. Um, you know, this is using microorganisms to turn sugars uh, and starches into fermented products like, you know, beer, wine, uh, even insulin. Um, and, and now it's even in ice cream. So the, the idea is that introducing this technology into many products that we would see on store shelves uh, would, would be great. Um, another area would be vertical farming. Um, carbon, the carbon footprint, as I think my, uh, my colleagues mentioned before, the carbon footprint of long distance cold storage uh, to transport uh, fresh produce is significant. Um, so there's a whole new generation of vertical farms um, out there that use energy efficient LED lights uh, to produce year round crops that are close to home. So you don't have to deal with the refrigeration issue. Uh, and finally, there are things like biogas, right? Using anaerobic digesters that capture methane uh, as a green natural gas. It's not a, a pure, uh, pure solution, but it is an interim uh, solution that could be helpful. Those are way good. There's that's so many of them. Thank you so much. <laughs> I just want to um, kind of um, highlight that the word when I said R, it, it meant refuse. The fourth R. Oh, sorry. Okay. And, um, there's a pun there because refuse is also waste. And we want to kind of move away from the term waste and how I'm reading this and uh, kind of in terms of a circular economy, there is no waste. Uh, if you would want to add anything there in terms of our knowledge base on waste. I think, you know, I, I would probably just go back to this whole notion of a, of a sufficiency based uh, circular economy. Um, waste becomes an issue when, when there's excess, right? Uh, so, Part of this is, is, is re-educating consumers um, so that they themselves are, you know, it's, there's, it's a shared responsibility. Uh, you know, industry uh, corporations have a responsibility, but, and consumers have a responsibility and there's an education component um, for how do you even generate less waste to begin with by a shift in your mindset. Um, and waste that is generated, uh, can be reused in the context of a, of a circular economy. Um, but ideally you, you keep kind of minimizing it over time so that uh, whatever is generated can be uh, recycled or repurposed in a way that is, is not harmful to, to the earth. Thank you. Um, very um, briefly, in terms of you touched upon alternate ways to govern, um, we are in this project trying to do regional collaboration and uh, with each having their own authority, which each governmental agency. So also given the inter uh, sectoral nature of a circular economy, it, there are no silos, but there are also um, authorities vested in different bodies for specialization, say in transportation, land use, water, et cetera. How do you kind of see all that interplaying in San Diego and what kind of a role do you see for the county to play in this? I, you know, I, great question. Um, so, so one thing we've learned is that, you know, the most intractable problems of our society, right? As you said, you, you, our society's grand challenges um, can't be explained or resolved through these fragmented approaches, right? That don't draw on multiple disciplines and, and bypass the interdependence uh, between business and institutions and the physical environment. Um, so, you know, the government sector has a mandate, uh, right, to protect the public interest. And, and so this polycentric approach, which is, you know, often used in the context of a common pool resource. So if we think of, of you know, the food system as a, as a common pool resource, which I was trying to make a case for, um, then this is predicated on, on equal participation and equal value uh, and decision-making power of all these stakeholders, you know, across disciplines, across sector, sectors, um, so it's, it's a very equitable and decentralized approach to decision making. Um, so I see the county as having a, a very significant role um, in that context, in that framework. Thank you very much, Anne. And thank you very much to our presenters for today. Um, that concludes our stakeholder presentations for today. I want to remind us that the, the US EPA tells us that about half of total global emissions 
of greenhouse gases come from extraction and processing of materials, food, and fuels. And from plastics alone, I expect it to double by 20, 2060. Local communities, particularly those in, with environmental justice concerns, they experience uh, environmental and human health impacts of waste more than any others. There were many topics here, particularly with regard to waste and landfill issues that we weren't able to cover, but we will be um, revisiting this topic later. I wanted to, because I kept Anthony waiting, if you can uh, go forward before I continue with the program, if you can come on audio, Anthony. Cool, thank you. Um, really quick, just wanted to address some comments from Mary Matava before the Marine Carbon Project is now kind of gearing or uh, suggesting around like a quarter inch application. So that might cost $500, $1,000 per acre for San Diego's 100,000 acres of rangeland, just as one example. That would still be cost prohibitive, you know, basically uh, billions of dollars. And so one of the only ways forward to transition those acres or implement practices like compost application at scale would be through circular economy. Um, and so I couldn't agree more with uh, what Professor Doshi has been presenting. Um, but basically, I think that it has to be a slightly broader circular economy than is proposed. And so I want to make an analogy to CRV fees for recycled aluminum, let's say. And so, you know, I think some of the discussion here by local uh, procurement and these things, it would be like saying, let's take the, you know, aluminum from Lo the LaCroix can or the Pepsi can. Let's keep all those separate in their own separate circular economies and we'll create these new infrastructures to recycle those. Whereas with CRV fee overall, it sort of like doubles the recycling rate or creates these incentives to finance recycling, but it's aggregated. So there's a five cent fee on every can, and then that goes towards the recycling of every can. And so I'm suggesting that we approach the circular economy of food and soil in the same way. Zero Free Print does this at the city and county level, as well as at the state level. But so introducing extremely nominal and modest fees, essentially, a penny, five cents, whatever it might be, that it could be at restaurants, it could be at tourism, that would then fund these kinds of healthy soil practices at scale. Some examples of this are going on in Portland, where there's a 1% fee on corporations over a billion dollars in sales with 500000 per year in Portland. It's the CES fee. I can send links. That generates $120 million a year for renewable energy. A similar fee in San Diego could generate $150 million or more a year for the decarbonization of the food system through healthy soil. There are similar fees being introduced in Hawaii, a $50 per year visitor fee for climate solutions. This would generate $500 million a year for climate solutions. Every solution could be afforded if we could introduce these small fees. I could go on at length. Thank you so much, Anthony. Um, if you can send us the information as um, sure. just a reminder. Yeah, thank you. Just email us, chat. All of these are being recorded. Sure. And the presentations are being recorded in both English and Spanish channels. We will be posting these presentations publicly as well. So um, this is going to help us a lot in preparing the implementation playbook. So appreciate all your feedback. So now next, I'll just turn it over. 